Welcome, my dear friends, to part two. Uh, I made this in two parts, to be honest, because I was trying to get this all recorded, and I was actually just thinking my daughter's about to get home, but I forgot that my wife is taking them to the dentist today, so I have extra time, so I'm going to jump right into part two. Part B, chapter four, presentation. Let's keep going on this idea of emotional and personality development in infancy. Welcome back, love yous. Hope you're doing well. Let's do it. So, ethology. Ethology, the study of human behavior and social organization from a biological perspective. We've been doing a lot of ethology in this course, but we're going to use ideas from like attachment is an example of ethology, an idea of something you see in the animal kingdom too. And it'd be, well, it'd be sort of uh, arrogant to think that, you know, things that are relevant to all other aspects of life have no relevance to us especially around things like bonding behavior. And we're going to use ideas around this to look at the idea of attachment. But first, by popular demand, even though none of you actually asked for it, I'm just thinking you might have thought it when I was talking about that octopus video. I got it for you. I want to show you this idea of the distributed mind. All right. And it talk about ethology. This is like an example of how what does this mean for our understanding of even what mind is or what cognitive processing is or what sensory motor would mean to an octopus. I hope you find this interesting. So come on, how cool is that video? You know, as psych students find that, I think you'd find that video pretty wild, right? That like, I think because everything they're saying there about the octopus could apply to a, a child, right? Like eventually you could map the electrical activity of a child's brain and actually see what the child's seeing. I think on the last section in my earliest part of the recording in the last in part a i said something about how if you google japanese dream machine and you'll see how they're already trying to map the visual experience of well the visual experience just that so belby and ainsworth come along with this idea and mary ainsworth very famous psychologist but also like kind of at this point of where um, understanding because there's this huge period in psychology where they're very interested in studying animals and seeing what they could learn and this idea of attachment and attachment theory is basically this idea of looking at the relationship that forms between mom and baby that this ability and need to form an attachment relationship early in life and that that's actually a genetic thing it's actually genetically embedded in the baby to need that early attachment to mom and that it's that deep and mom has this emotional bond with the baby and that's great and that's highly emotional and there's that's highly biochemical and that's very physical too and there's lots of genetic preparation and and not prepar uh inheritance as you said a lot of genetic inheritance that helps mom develop that deep affectional or emotional bond with baby but from mom to, ba to baby it's this emotional relationship very deep maybe the deepest mom will ever have but from baby to mom it's complete attachment so when we use the word attachment we're talking about babies tied to mom that mom is security right the emotional tie to a parent experienced by the infant okay so that's gonna be important because that's a easy test question right attachment is what baby feels for mom bond is what mom feels for baby and that sometimes children can have tough times with that and there's a thing called reactive attachment disorder which is sort of what what it sounds like right an attachment disorder reactive like how the baby's reacting to mom is this is the problem this is the same problem i mentioned earlier in the course if mom's depressed that sometimes if mom's depressed she can interact less with baby and it's not mom's depression that affects baby it's the reduced frequency of interaction so if mom is experiencing depression what's really important for her to know is that she needs to interact with baby more than she thinks she does her self-assessment of how much to interact we know is skewed it's just a similar idea so Ainsworth so what Ainsworth and Bowlby are going to try to do is look at this relationship can we say that different mom baby combos have different types of quality of attachment right and 
if we're saying these early relationships are so important and if we take ideas like what Freud and Piaget are saying seriously or we try to actually test this and we actually try to see like does this early attachment to parent tell us anything meaningful about differences between groups of kids and does it tell us anything about differences that are meaningful and how those kids will be later which is the stability thing that I keep bringing up it's like psychological measurements are much more interesting if they predict things later and again right you know this already I don't need to almost even say this but when I say predict things later I don't mean in a cause and effect way I mean in a increasing likelihoods of it happening way increased probability it's all probability it's not cause effect it's probability of correlation it's the more uh, the more correct way to say it news on, so the good news on this topic sorry I started that point too early the good news on this topic is that the majority of parents do manage to develop relationships we classify as attachment and parenting is difficult and it's tough when you're talking about a topic like this where you're sort of trying to say like there's certain characteristics that we consider more growth promoting than others and it but you're trying to not be all judgmental and at the same time you can't act like differences don't have differences in outcome so there's this inherent issue when you're trying to talk about the difficult complexity of human experience that if we act like well sometimes you just have to say unpleasant things like there's differences in quality of parenting approaches if what you're talking about is developmental outcomes in relation to I should finish that sentence in relation to developmental outcomes right so let's talk about that say we're at the mall I don't know why I keep using my examples of the mall because I guess that's where you'd randomly run into someone and say say I come up to North Bay to do this do some some reason and I'm in the mall and I run into you at some store and you see and you're and I'm with my daughter and you meet Evelyn who's five and I say hey Evelyn this is my cool student from up in uh, North Bay at, at Nipsing and you're like oh hi Evelyn you're probably not gonna be like so what do you think of the current political climate you're probably gonna be like hi how are you and I can see myself so I'll limit my my uh, acting but you'd probably get lower get a little bit expressive you'd slow how you talk you actually use certain vocal styles with infants like ha, this is embarrassing but hi how are you oh well, that's good and see what I'm doing is actually if you broke down what I was doing I was lengthening the vowel sounds in the words which is actually teaching them how to talk and that you don't have to be taught that that's the interesting thing is like people naturally have this tendency to open up lower lower their voice tone talk softer expand their use of vowels they have most adults automatically develop this distinctive pattern of interacting behavior and vocal styles towards infants it's so interesting it's like this is like hardwired it's like one of the things that blew me away about being a dad was how how genetically prepared you are and whatever that means it's like it brings forth certain qualities um, that are very interesting and very difficult to define but that's sort of what we're trying to do here is that if we're saying like it's, it like seems to actually change how you talk and interact and you actually it's like now it's like you'll notice when I'm talking and not even trying to and I'm like swaying back and forth just because I do that so much with the baby it's like that's a new pattern of behavior if you met me five years ago I definitely didn't go like this when I was talking you know it's and that the more sync parent is with baby that that seems to be linked that degree of synchronicity or synchrony and parent-child interaction seems to contribute to cognitive development to the development of cognitive functions and you know the in the child like something super important so when we're looking at this idea of the parents bond and this is kind of a picture brings back memory so this was when Evie my first daughter was born and this is right outside the Kitchener Hospital and you know the developmental psychology evidence on this is very clear that fathers and mothers interact with babies in different ways and those different ways of interacting with the baby are important for the baby and 
that the baby benefits from both types of interaction. Okay, so now this is kind of a, a complex notion, but we've been talking about this a lot, this model that the child's developing, right? That by the time, if you look at the bottom there, by the time the child gets to about four or five, we would, as developmental psychology, as developmentalists or developmental psychologists, we're looking at this idea of like, by the time the kid reaches about four or five, they sort of have their model of the world and is the world trustable and a lot of this comes down to okay these three things okay so this is saying like where does the internal model like what what does the model of the world contain it's like is there an attachment figure that's available is there expectation of affection is there expectation that so first of all that there's somebody if i'm in need that can help me and that that will be affectionate help and I can use that affectionate help providing adult that attachment figure that parent to be a secure base right so when we're talking about like what trust is it's like kind of these three things like is there someone there to trust can I trust their reaction and can I use that trust to generalize trust towards this idea of the world being safe and the idea is that this is getting back to Erickson that if the answer to that is no then the world's unsafe then mistrust then things are scary and everything's a threat and these internalized models become elaborated from the time a child's one to the time they're about five Which is a wild thought, right? My, I have a daughter that recently turned five, so it's a pretty wild thought to think my three-month-old's internal model hasn't even really started construction yet. It's not going to start construction for a few more months, for about nine more months, and then my oldest is, hers is sort of established. Right now she's at school and playing out that model and assimilating and accommodating. So it's a complex idea what this idea of attachment means, right? It's like, can the baby attach to mom in a way that allows mom to be a safe place of dependable support? have you do a brief interaction with some play then in just a few minutes we'll send you back in you step in the door Everett Waters is studying how far our childhood experiences influence our behavior as adults we'll come down to the lab okay. we'll do this now this experiment which I watched through a two-way mirror is designed to gauge how secure is the crucial relationship between mother and child Will be on top. The value of the test 
has been established in studies that would watch a child, one year old, and then follow it up and interview them about their relationships to their parents when they were 21 years old. So we're quite confident in the long-term significance of this relationship. After several minutes play, the mother is signaled to leave the room. in the experiment is the child's reaction to her mother's return. The important clue is whether the baby's able to become calmed down by the contact with the mother, get back to play. Sometimes it takes a couple of minutes. But you see, when the mother was out, she was only interested in the mother, no interest in the toys. Now she has a contact with the mother, She's beginning to show a little interest in the environment, and shortly she'll be right back with the toys where we started. So you would call this a secure one? Yes, yes. She's certainly much happier. Yeah. Now, and this is an insecure baby. We get the measure of the baby's play before the separation. When the mother leaves, the baby cries, goes to the door following her, now, we, we sent the mother right back in, but the point here is not to distress the baby. We're just trying to challenge it. The baby puts her hands to her face in a sad expression, puts her face down. When she picks her up, she keeps her head down, her arms out, and then she sits in the chair holding the baby. The baby's still sullen. He's, he's low-keyed. So you would call the, this insecure Yes, attachment. insecure. He's avoidant. He's, he's not engaging her, and it's not be, the reunion's not effective. And it's important to remember here that the thing that upset him was her absence. Her, re, her return should be the solution to his problem. Now, this is another pattern that we see in babies who are not good at using their mother as a secure base at home. This baby is also insecure. But you'll see, we get a look at his play before the separation. The mother's left, and when she returns, she picks him up. He can't calm down. He's still upset. She offers a toy to amuse him or to comfort him or to distract him, and he slaps it away. She offers another. He slaps it away. He's angry. He's, he's, we call these babies resistant or ambivalent because they both want her back, and yet can't use the contact, we think that the difficulty is that in the past, when he sought comfort, she's been inconsistent as to whether she's available and responsive or not. Do you think these really are indications for vulnerability for depression later in life? I don't think that insecure attachment in infancy is the cause of depression in adulthood. However, when a child learns that he can trust his mother to be available and responsive, he's beginning to learn that you can trust other people, that you can turn to them when you're in trouble. The baby is also taught by the mother, as he gets older, how to understand his emotions, how to construe events that happen to them. You know, every bump in the road is not a disaster. This is a powerful asset when you encounter difficulties in life.
Okay, so before I get into this slide and look at the four types of uh, classifications of attachment, because that last video sort of gave a little bit of a depiction. Attachment is this fundamental close bond between two people. There's no shortage of theories about infant attachment, but probably the three most famous theorists to talk about this idea were Freud, Erickson, and then Bowlby and Ainsworth. Freud theorized that infants became attached to the person or object that provides them with oral satisfaction, like for feeding. For most infants, that's mother, because she's likely to be feeding the infant, and clearly feeding is the most important survival instinct, as Freud thought. And then people came along like Harry Harlow in his research with the monkeys and trying to prove love. And I think I've showed you that video of, inf of uh, monkey attachment Harlow removed infant monkeys from their mothers at birth, and for six months they were few. Uh, sur yeah, they were with the two surrogate mothers, the one that was made of wire, the other made of cloth. Half the infant monkeys were fed by the wire mother, mother half by the cloth. Periodically, the amount of time the infants would spend with either the wire or the cloth mother was computed. Regardless of which mother fed them, the infant monkeys spent way more time with the cloth mother, even if the wire mother not the cloth mother provided nourishment. The monkeys still spent most of their time with the cloth mother. When Harlow frightened the monkeys, and I showed that video, when Harlow frightened the monkeys, those that ran to the, they ran to the cloth mother. Whether the mother provided comfort seemed to determine whether the monkey associated that mother with security. This study clearly demonstrated that feeding is not the crucial element in the attachment process, and that contact comfort is important. It's not just the connection between mom and baby. It's not just feeding. It's the comfort that, and security that, that that is emotionally and socially associated with that. I have here in bold. However, is this really displacing Freud or merely adding an additional layer of nuanced understanding? Physical comfort also plays a role in Erickson's 1968 view of an infant's development. Recall Erickson's proposal that during the first year of life, infants are in this stage of trust versus mistrust. Physical comfort and sensitive care, according to Erickson, are key to establishing a basic level of trust during infancy. You don't have to have any of this written down. This is context. The... Oh, darn, I lost my spot. The infant's sense of trust, in turn, is the foundation for attachment and sets the stage for lifelong expectations that the world will be a good and pleasant place. The ethological perspective of, of Bowlby and Ainsworth, uh, Bowlby kind of first and then later research with Ainsworth, stresses the importance of attachment in the first year of life and the responsiveness of caregiver. Bowlby believed that both the infant and their primary caregiver are biologically predispositioned to form attachments. He argued that the newborn is biologically equipped to elicit attachment behaviors from mom, things like crying, clinging, cooing, smiling. Later, the infant crawls, walks, follows the caregiver. The immediate result of this is to keep the primary caregiver nearby. The long-term effect is to increase, increase the infant's chance of survival. Right, so let me say that again. There's two kind of goals of all those behaviors, right? Smiling, um, cooing, which is like that, them making these little girl, gurgling sounds, trying to start to talk, clinging, smiling. It's like that keeps mom closer, short term. Long term, it increases the likelihood of survival. So then that last video, the Ainsworth uh, situation there, it showed you this scenario where mom's in the room with baby, mom leaves, baby's distressed, mom re-enters and then we're watching how baby's able to use mom as that safe place or not as that secure base and if the baby's able to use mom as a secure base right then they're able to like go back to play and stuff so a securely attached baby we would say is able to use their caregiver as a secure base and so mom's there and mom makes this safe and now that mom's back and i'm calm back down now i'm going to go back and play again and the idea is there's sort of like what we would consider it securely attached and then insecurely attached and there's sort of like three subtypes of insecure attachment 
right? And you saw that in the in depicted in the video, right? Avoidant, and that's sort of like this physical. The baby was crying because mom was gone. Now mom's back, but baby can't use mom as a way to calm down. It's not soothing. The baby's almost avoiding, like quite physically leaning back in that video. Resistance, same idea. It's like that was like where the baby was like resisting mom's attempt to calm it down and remember this like resistant and avoidant like clinging to the caregiver then resisting by fighting the closeness and it said in the video remember they were upset because mom was gone right so now the baby's like avoiding physically pulling back or like resisting and kind of not allowing mom's presence to calm them down and then uh how did I say this? In the most negative situations, often in scenarios of abuse or neglect, babies can show uh, instant. No, although not always the case, that's not always the cause. Um, babies can show disorganized attachment. Just think what that would be if maybe the person that's supposed to that is providing love and nourishment is also maybe hurting them or also sometimes not there, and their idea of what well their model of the world is disorganized. And disoriented it might appear dazed confused and fearful Bowlby argued that the infants develop a, this internal working model of attachment a simple mental model of the caregiver the relationship to that person and the self and how deserving they are of care the infant's internal working model of attachment with the caregiver influences the infant and later the child and later that child's responses to other people. The internal model of attachment has played a pivotal role in the discovery of links between attachment and subsequent emotional understanding, conscious development, and self-concept. And I have there in bold, this is like an interesting like kind of research question, an important, interesting area to ask about is whether infancy is a critical or a sensitive period for development. A meta-analysis found that securely attached infants was linked to social competency with peers in childhood and further studies revealed that infant attachment in childhood behavioral inhibition predicted adolescent social anxiety symptoms so the level of attachment seems to even be linked with things like anxiety in adulthood and obviously it's not a cause effect it's saying that there seems to be a link it seems to be that these earliest attachments and this is Bowlby's point they form the model in the baby's head of what relationship is and then that model gets played out so if the model is disorganized then how it gets played out is probably going to be disorganized and he means this at the deepest possible way he can mean it and in an inverse if it's secure and if it's they're interpreting the world different and therefore they're engaging it and therefore they're being interpreted different and therefore they're being engaged differently and that these classifications, meaning you could classify typology, you could make categories, and these categories are pr predictive of, well, I just gave some examples there, right, things like, in an extensive longitudinal study, early secure attachment was linked with positive emotional health, high self-esteem, self-confidence, social competence and interaction with peers, teachers, camp counselors, romantic partners and adolescents. Meta-analysis found, meta-analysis just means like a study that looks at a bunch of studies. So say if I want to study the link between two things, instead of one, a meta-analysis means you're looking at like maybe a hundred studies that have looked at that and look at what all their findings are and then combine it. That's meta-analysis. Meta-analysis found that secure attachment in infancy was linked to social competence with peers in childhood. I think I feel like I already read that. All right, how's that for a nine minute slide? Sorry about that. Okay, next slide. So hearing this on, if you remember earlier, we don't write this down. So you have this in your last slide. So I kind of got lost on my rant there and I didn't give you a good breakdown of these. So I thought since that last slide, I, my recording was like nine minutes instead of trying to redo that somehow. Um, I just duplicated the slide. Okay. So you already have this written down, but I just want to give you a bit better description of those four types. Okay. So Ainsworth 1979 earned her 
1979 is when her work came out. But before that, she earned her BA and, and eventually her PhD from the University of Toronto, which is pretty interesting, Canadian. Ainsworth created this, this thing called the strange situation. Okay, so a strange situation for the baby. A situation where an observational measure of an infant's attachment in which the infant experiences a series of introduction, separations, and reunions with the caregiver and an adult stranger. Okay, so it's like the, a stranger comes in the room and they're looking at how baby responds. In the strange situation, researchers hope that their observations will provide information about the infant's motivation to be near a caregiver and the, the degree to which the caregiver's presence provides the infant with security and confidence. Securely attached babies use the caregiver as a secure base from which to explore their environment. When they're in the presence of the caregiver, securely attached infants explore the room, examine toys that have been placed in the room. When the caregiver leaves, securely attached infants might mildly protest, but when the caregiver returns, these infants reestablish their positive interaction with the parent, perhaps smiling or climbing on their lap. Then they often resume playing with toys. Insecure avoidant babies show insecurity by avoiding the caregiver. In the strange situation, these babies engage in little interaction with the caregiver, are not distressed when the caregiver leaves the room, usually do not re-establish contact upon return, may even turn their backs. If contact's re-established, the infant usually leans away or looks away, avoidant. Insecure resistant babies often cling to the caregiver and resist by fighting against the closeness, perhaps pushing or kicking away. In the strange situation, these babies often cling anxiously to the caregiver and don't explore the playroom. When the caregiver leaves, they often cry loudly and then push away if anyone tries to comfort the baby. Or when they, sorry, when the caregiver tries to comfort the baby upon return. And then the last one, again, you don't have to have this down. I'm just trying to give, make this a little bit more comprehensive. Insecure, disorganized babies are disorganized and not disoriented in the strange situation these babies may appear dazed confused fearful to be classified as disorganized babies must show strong patterns of avoidance or resistance or display certain behaviors such as extreme fearfulness around the caregiver again oftentimes not for positive reasons so when looking at this idea of where does it come from right like so why does if you look at the origins, why are some children more secure, some children more insecure in their attachments? And I wanted to kind of really highlight these ideas again. And one is this idea of emotional availability. And notice how that's not just physical availability, but that mom or the primary caregiver is emotionally present. The primary caregiver is ability to, sorry to say that again, but to be emotionally available. And this is like so key, the emotional avail availability of the parent. And then second of all, if they're not just available, so mom's, let's just, so mom's available for the baby, the baby needs mom. And when mom shows up, mom responds to the cues baby's giving, right? So some of this is maybe baby needs to be comfort, maybe baby needs to be fed, maybe baby needs to be changed and, and how responsive is mom's action to the specific need being expressed by baby right so that mom's response is contingent dependent on what baby is asking for right so baby's not mom keeps trying to feed but baby really just needs to be changed right or mom can't figure out but I, you're changed you're fed and it's like well she needs to be rocked and burped because she has gas in her system she needs to be soothed Right, so it's like it's a, this lack of sync. So it's like this attachment is related to a, emotional availability and degree of sync, contingent responsiveness. That the responsiveness, the response provided by mom, is contingent, dependent on. So that means like when baby needs to be fed, the baby's fed. When baby needs to be changed, the baby's changed. And it's not like we're talking about that you need to be a perfect mom. Remember I said earlier that most parents are able to establish secure attachments. But the absolute end of the day, what babies need is love, attention, and consistency. So if for a secure attachment, you need an emotionally available parent who responds in a contingent way, 
But what about when we're looking at some of these types of insecure attachments and we're looking at avoidant attachment? This is more common when a parent, when that sink's not right, right? So maybe mom's overstimulating to a baby that has a very low threshold for anxiety. So the baby's getting stressed. And maybe if mom was a bit more chill, that wouldn't be an issue. Or maybe the baby's really chill and mom's really chill. Like the, the match depends, right? So it's more, so moms can almost be too stimulating or not enough stimulating, which is, again, why it's so difficult being a parent. It's like this Goldilocks idea. The porch can't be too hot or too cold. It has to be somewhere in the middle. And it comes back to that with a lot of these things. All right, but think of think of that idea, right? Maybe mom's overstimulating, so the baby's avoiding that. It almost makes sense that that would be sort of the, one of the cause. Resistant, more common when babies or when parents are more inconsistent or un, or unreliable. Right, so baby's resistant to depend on that because in the past, consistency, it couldn't trust that there was consistency. It's not that mom didn't love baby when mom loved baby. It was the consistency piece and then disorganized and maybe abusive scenarios or if the parent was abused and traumatized or if the baby's hurt. Or... Again, I'm going to... You can probably think of that scenario, but that's... You know, child protection matters because these early years are so critical. Significant changes in the relationship can affect attachment patterns, obviously, like the easiest example to think of would be, say, something like a, a separation or um, maybe the development of an illness or a mental illness with, for mom. Significant changes in the relationship between mom and baby can affect the attachment pattern, but Bowlby suggests at the age of about five that this internal model has been created and we've kind of already been talking about this but that, that model then is what's imposed on other relationships with like teachers peers others right and this almost idea of what freud would have called transference that this model gets then transferred and becomes this like in a piaget word working model so how's that for you i just freestyle combine the three things from the slide before this is like erickson trust Piaget's idea of a combination of simulation, Freud's idea of this emerging psychodynamic directly tied to genetic survival, and then Bowlby's idea of like this model matters because it becomes the foundation of future relationships. It becomes the example. The example that then gets other things get judged in relation to. Right? This internal model. Think of what an internal model is. Think of what a model of a plane is. It's not actually a plane, but it's like a depiction of a plane. It's like their internal model is not the actual world, but it's their representation of it. And so my point again is like, I sort of keep making points like this today, but I think these are relevant when we're talking about why to spend so much time in a course like this speaking about early development. And one of the reasons is because of the predictive ability, right? That we, the more we know about this stage and how children perform in this stage and in this scenario, the degree of uh, sync between relationship with mom and, and baby in this thing called attachment quality. Well, it matters because we know that children rated as more securely attached to moms in infancy tend to be more sociable later in life towards friends and siblings, tend to be less clingy and dependent on teachers, less aggressive and disruptive at school, more empathetic and emotionally mature. And that sort of makes sense if you're saying like they're developing this model early and then that model forms a foundation of relationships that the more secure and the more healthy this model is, the more healthy, the more likely it's to bounce off other models in a healthy way. Because that's the other complexity is that not just my kids doing that. Every kid in the kindergarten class is playing out their own model. So just 
to keep keep going on this point, right? I got just like six more points. Like kids to score is more securely atta uh, attached to the parents. Also, as we move into adolescence and adulthood, so these early scores of infants have relevance to being more socially skilled in the early years, more likely to be le uh, leaders, have higher self-esteem, and cro increased sociability through early, middle, and late adulthood. Affects their own parenting behaviors in the future. Demonstrates that attachment relationships become the foundation for future social relationships. I guess six isn't really on that list. It's like five, and then six is my summary point. It demonstrates, this all demonstrates that attachment relationships become the foundation for future relationships. And that's a heavy sentence. So the idea is that attachment sort of develops in these four phases, right, age-wise. So if we look at the first stage as being from birth to about two months, okay, so the infant's directing their attachment to human figures, strangers, siblings, parents are equally likely to elicit smiling or crying from the infant, right? So like right now, if, uh, so a couple weekends ago, I was in uh, Gravenhurst with my, my family on my side, so like, my brother's family, my sister's family, and my parents and my family. And like all the aunts and uncles were like my brother and his wife and my sister and her husband and both my parents and we're all wanting to hold Charlotte and Charlotte will like smile and to her it's almost just other figures. But as they start to get this kind of two to seven months, it starts to focus usually on primarily mom. Again, obviously there can be different um, specific situations. It's not always mom biological mom but the attachment tends to focus in on one person and then the baby also starts to be able to get way better at distinguishing between people they know or, or don't know so it's not surprising that around the end of this period is where we start to see stranger anxiety phase three from seven months to two years this these more specific attachments are developing to the parents this increased locomotor skills so the baby's moving around a lot more babies are actively seeking contact actively seeking that reinforcement wanting that positive attachment interaction from 24 months on children start to become aware more of others feelings their goals their plans start to take those into account when deciding their own actions so this idea of this developing level of intensity that just says goals planning is just what's covered by my uh, camera so this idea that attachment sort of evolves or develops sorry evolves means across lifespans develop means within one lifespan so as the child now so now the, okay think about this for a sec social orientation and uh understanding Thought it did yeah so this goes back to the work of a, 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 someone named ross thompson so if you wanted to just write down these points i'm sort of going to give a little bit more story around them but talk about this so in ross thompson's view since so 2016 infants are these social emotional beings who show strong interest in their social world and are motivated to orient themselves towards it and to understand it as infants develop their ability to crawl walk run they're able to explore and expand their world enhance locomotive and cognitive skills influence and are influenced by their social relationships reminding us that these processes are intricately uh, intertwined right so relationship development learning to move learning how to process the social world that these things are all part of the same thing from the early in their development, infants are captivated by their social world. Young infants are attuned to the sound of human voices and stare intently at faces, especially the caregiver's face. Within minutes of birth, infants look prefer preferentially towards face-like patterns. And as they develop, they begin to become adept at interpreting facial expressions. Face-to-face -face play often begins to characterize caregiver-infant interaction. So that's so interesting to read that like like right now with my daughter it's like what i'll like have, I'll have her laid down on the bed and just kind of bring my face closer until we like kind of touch noses and bring back and she she laughs it's like it's, it's interesting right this idea of infants uh face-to-face -face play 
often begins to characterize caregiver infant interaction when the infant's about two to three months, like the exact age of Charlotte. Such play reflects the parent's motivation to create a positive emotional state in their infant. Infants also learn about the social world through contexts other than just face-to-face -face interaction with caregiver. Even though infants as young as six months show an interest in each other, their interactions with peers increase considerably in the later half of the second year. Between 18 and 24 months, children have a marked increase in their imitative and reciprocal play. Imitative means like when my daughter's pretending that she's a knight fighting a dragon that's imitative she's imitating something reciprocal means i'm gonna do this you do that and this like back and forth play <laughs> i probably look dumb doing that but whatever between 18 and 24 months children markedly increase their Im imitative and reciprocal play for example imitating nonverbal actions like jumping or running one study involved presenting one and two year olds with a simple cooperative task that consists of pulling a lever to get an attractive toy any coordinated action of the one-year-olds appeared to be coincidental rather than cooperative, whereas by the time people were or the kids were two, their behavior was shown to be much more actively cooperative towards reaching a goal when motivated. So those four points are a more simple way of saying those paragraphs but basically this idea that these things are dynamically interconnected that their social world their orientation towards it their understanding of it their ability their understanding of themselves and others are all this like complexity it's like how complex is your life and your understanding of your life and your world and you it's like this complexity starts young and it's it's expanding we're very complex us humans are complex creatures. We're like onions, to quote the famous Shrek. All right, next slide. Okay, so again, um, if you wanted to jot some of those points down, and I'll kind of, I'm trying to kind of give you it in a little bit more point form, but the ability to perceive people as engaging is in intentional goal directed behavior is this important social cognitive accomplishment. So this is this first idea that by the end of the first year in life, the baby is able to start to know that you're doing something because you're wanting to and because you're wanting to have some result happen, right? So that your things aren't just random in the world, that people are doing things intentionally for goal-directed ways. And the idea here is that that's something that the baby starts to realize again. At no point am I suggesting that the baby could articulate any of these developing understandings. The ability, um, yeah, so this occurs near the end of the first year. Joint attention and gaze following, so joint attention is like us both doing something at the same time and paying attention, that's what gaze following is, like your gaze. So it's like if I'm looking over here, if my daughter Evie, this is an example, right? If my daughter Effie came into the room and I was staring here, standing at the wall, staring, because just like, you don't have to go very far that way. I shouldn't do this because now my camera's going to be off, but like the wall's right there. It probably wasn't worth all that camera readjustment that you had to watch just to show you that there's a wall there. You probably could have took my word. But if my point was, if I'm standing here like this, just staring at the wall and Evie walks in, she's immediately going to come over and be like, what are you looking at? Because as humans, we know how to follow gaze, right? We know how to fit what you're looking at gives me some kind of, I'll fix it between takes, that what, what you're looking at gives me information about what you're viewing as important in the environment. that the ability to link intention with emotional expression develops during this second year of life. The understanding of others' intentions and goals improves significantly during this second year. Infants react differently to adults who display expected versus unexpected emotional responses to them. Right, so when babies do something that's supposed to be funny and you react by laughing, they're more likely to be like, oh, okay, cool, like this, they're more likely to see that as familiar as you responded in a way that makes sense to their model. Of 
course, infants also have their own goals, and by their first birthday, they begin to direct caregivers' attention towards objects that capture their interests. Look at this, look at this, look at this. Even though they're not, ooh, whatever, like it's not necessarily articulated words, but it sounds, and a lot of oohs and ahs and noises. interesting to think that the baby has this moment where it starts to kind of at this deep level understand that people are doing things for specific reasons and with specific goals and on purpose okay so cascades like this would this would be this image is kind of designed to just give you an idea of what the term means so if this would be a cascading waterfall like there's like water boom goes down a level goes down a level goes down a level it's like this idea that your development is there's layers to it there's levels to it there's you know the you're this complex interaction between all these elements of your life and van reason and colleagues and came up with this idea of a developmental cascade model which involves the connections looking at the connections across all these different domains of time that influence your developmental pathways and the outcomes in your life this developmental cascade includes connections between these wide range of biological and cognitive and social emotional processes like attachment and can also involve social contexts such as our families and our friend groups and our schools and our culture And that these links can produce either negative or positive outcomes at different points in our development, such as in infancy or early childhood or middle and late childhood or adolescence or adulthood. Right, so this is kind of a cool thing to say is like, or to think about is, you're this complex being, we say it all the time, right? And we say all the time about how, you know, in psychology, there's the emotional aspect of self and the cognitive aspect of self and the physical aspect and the spiritual aspect and the relational aspect and the social, whatever. It's like, okay, as a thought exercise, okay, but you're just you and you're the observer of those things, right? The, you know, not to hit too much with this consistently in this course, but it's like, in a few years you'll have other you know you'll have other teachers and eventually i'll just be you know if you remember anything from me remember that idea right your your mask isn't your true self your mask is your ego or your persona your true self well you'll never fully understand either will i because so much of it's unconscious only parts of it are conscious and our self is far more than our thoughts or our emotions or or these incredibly complex Freudian psychodynamic humans developmental cascade model all right let's keep going a couple more slides here so social context right and it's this idea of like now that we've I have here now that we've explored the infant's emotional and personality development and the idea of attachment let's examine the social context in which this occurs and that every kid is developing this within a certain situation a certain they're being parented by certain people that have a certain marriage quality and that marriage quality influences the way they parent and the parenting influences the behavior and the behavior of the kid influences the parenting and the way that influences the parenting influences the quality of the marital relationship and this idea that they're all in this interaction and that the family can be thought of as this constellation or this constellation like the big dipper like a constellation a set of stars it's like this constellation of subsystems that there's for example i'm going to use this and this is again it can be a bit of a tongue twister but it's like in my family just looking at my immediate family who lives here there's like me and my wife but then there's also like me and my wife and evie and then there's also like me and my wife and charlotte then there's me and evie and me and charlotte and then there's charlotte and evie and then there's 
Evie and Charlotte and Julie, and then there's Julie and Evie, and then there's Julie and Charlotte, and those are all the different subsystems, and all those different subsystems affect like this whole thing that we call our family unit. Each family member participates in several subsystems which have these reciprocal back and forth influences. Right, parents parenting can cause a disequilibrium of these unbalances, right? And as as parents are trying to adapt and maintain strong attachment to their infant, but also trying to maintain their marriage and also trying to like be a friend to their buddies and also try to be like and the boss is emailing at the same time too. So there's just like all these things, it's these complexities of the system. Okay, so reciprocal socialization. So this is this idea that the baby, so I have here some couples claim the baby had brought them together closer. Some say it moved them further apart which I know are two very different it, uh, scenarios, but I think it's safe to say that at the very least, it's going to change the dynamic. It's going to test it in new ways. And some people that's going to make it fall apart. And for some people that's going to make it reach to different levels of depth. And being parents enhances this sense of who we, of who you are to a certain degree. It's like, I don't know, I try to see myself sort of as Evie and Charlotte's dad. It's like, it's a huge part of how I see myself. It's a huge part of my identity. And this idea that like, we understand that the family home and especially the parents are the most powerful socialization influence on the child. But we often don't think of how the child also socializes the parents. So that's what reciprocal socialization, both directions bi-directional socialization children socialize parents just as parents socialize the child for many years socialization was viewed as a one-way process children were considered to be products of their parents socialization techniques but recent so this is by nashirima kangu kia and yamakoshi 19 i mean 2016 their research this is coming out of japan looking at parent-child interaction and as being reciprocal. Reciprocal socialization is socialization that's bi-directional, like it says there, both ways, an arrow that's pointed on both sides. That is, a child socializes a parent just as a parent socializes a child. These type of behaviors involve reciprocal socialization and infants are temporarily connected Mutually contingent behaviors such as one parent imitating the sound of another or mother responding with a vocalization to a body's hour movement. It's like it's like me um, going hoo 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 and my baby like giggling and then me doing it again and then her giggling. It's like we're both starting to sort of understand that I'm doing this because she's giggling and she's her giggling is making me do this and it's like we're kind of both shaping each other. And then scaffolding, and scaffolding is this idea that um, in developmental psychology, and I'm not sure if we've spent much time on Vakovsky yet and his idea of the zone of proximal development, but the Russian scientist that was, had this idea that like people learn differently in, in different environments, and you can actually construct these optimized learning environments where people can reach higher levels of performance than they could absent that environment. And the idea in developmental psychology is that parents can play this, can kind of intentionally create this scenario where the child's getting time with both parent and able to develop and that maternal interactions are often centered more on, on childcare. And, and that sort of makes sense. Remember, we're still talking about an infancy. And so, especially if mom is breastfeeding still, and parental interactions tend to like with that tend to be more focused on play especially rough and tumble play and rough and tumble play is critically important to children it's critically important it's one of the most undervalued things in our society it's absolutely necessary for full well-rounded development it teaches kids about all kinds of things 
all kinds of things. I'll try to cap this limit because it's my last slide and it's like I've been ranty on this whole presentation, but rough and tumble play is one of the most underlooked aspects of child development. Okay, you made it to the end of both presentations. Now you're ready for your eight key points to remember. All right, it's uh, 11.20 here, so let's keep the energy high. Love you all, and, and let's get into this. Point number one, emotion is a feeling or affect that occurs when a person is in a state or an interaction that is important to them. Infants display a number of emotions early in their development, such as crying, smiling, showing fear. Two fears that infants develop are stranger anxiety and a fear of separation from caregiver, right, which we can call separation anxiety if you want. As infants develop, it's important for them to increase their ability to regulate their emotions. Number two, temperament is an individual's behavioral style and characteristic way of responding emotionally. We looked at the research of Chess and Thomas who classified infants as easy, difficult, and slow to warm. We looked at Jerome Kagan's research that proposed that inhibition to the unfamiliar, right? So like how, um, how inhibited or how nervous they are of new situations, unfamiliar, is an important temperamental category. We looked at Roth, uh, Bart, and Bates, although I don't think I had their name on the slide, but we looked at this idea of effortful control, right? And we looked at low and high effortful control, like self-regulation, the ability to like use your own effortful control to calm yourself back down and the kids are different in their levels of that and then we looked at the idea of goodness of fit and how that can be an important aspect of understanding how a child uh, adjusts and goodness of fit refers to like the fit between mom and baby erickson argued that sorry my video is covering a little bit but i'll tell you i can tell you what it says erickson argued that an infant's first year is characterized by the stage of trust versus mistrust. Independence becomes a central theme of the second year of life, which is characterized by the stage of autonomy. A U T O N N O M Y. I think I got that right. I'm a spelling on the spot out loud. It's like not my specialty. Autonomy. You know how to spell it. Right? But that. So Erickson was saying this idea of like how the baby's starting to want to become more independent and that this is actually this push towards they want to start to become their own person. We're going to see this expand more and more in childhood as we get into the next uh, chapter in the next life stage, childhood. We looked at the work of Bowlby and then which led to Ainsworth and her study of the strange situation where the child's put in this experimental situation to test uh, attachment styles, and that this can be a useful tool for examining attachment. The infants differ in how they react to the caregiver leaving and then re-entering the room, and this shows kind of insights into how the baby sees the caregiver themselves and their relationship to the caregiver. Number five, infants show a strong interest in the social world and are motivated to understand it. Infants are more socially sophisticated and insightful at an earlier age than we previously thought. Number six, attachment is a close emotional bond between two people. In infancy, close or contact, comfort, and trust are important in the development of attachment, right? So that's the thing is like, it's not just mom feeding, it's that mom feeding makes the baby feel secure and attached and loved and comfort, comforted and safe. And it can't separate those things. Securely attached babies use the caregiver, usually the mother, as a secure base from which to explore their environment. Three types of insecure attachments exist. We call those avoidant, resistant, and disorganized. Okay, and again, I'm going kind of fast because we've already took notes on all this. Caregivers of securely attached babies are more sensitive to the baby's signals, are consistently available to meet their needs. Number seven, two more. The transition to parenthood requires considerable adaptation and adjustment on the part of parents, to say the least. Children socialize parents just as much as 
parents socialize children. Parents use a wide variety of methods to manage and guide infants' behavior. In general, mothers spend more time in caregiving than fathers do. Fathers tend to engage in more physical, playful interactions with infants than mothers do. Again, this is from observational data looking at actual engagement between mom and baby and dad and baby. Number eight, the quality of child care is um, uneven. All parents don't do the same quality of job with their kids, you know, across the whole world. And that's kind of saying it lightly. Quality child care can be achieved and maybe may provide many benefits, especially in scenarios where children are maybe in with a single parent or where the family's struggling a bit. Quality child care in these early years is so important. And a lot of you know that. A lot of you are interested in careers related to early childhood development. That's where you can play a huge role in people's lives. And it's this weird thing because you can play this huge role maybe, like especially if you're, say, like an early child care development uh, specialist. It's like you can maybe be playing these roles in these kids' lives and they may never even remember you, but you're playing this foundational role in helping establish a more healthy model, right? We said, like, in, until the kid's five, they're very interp influenceable about... You know, it's important that people see that there's that they can trust, right? Because Erickson's point was that there's a long, there's lots of drama ahead if the model of the world that you develop is one where it's threat based. You finished chapter four. Thanks for being an awesome class. Again, I, I enjoyed doing these, and uh, you know. I said it before, but I'll say it again. Take care of your loved ones. Be a good person like you already are. And uh, keep your stick on the ice in case the puck comes to you. Cheers.